Hi, my name is Terry Arnold, and I decided today that I need to tell you a story. Somebody asked me about my diagnosis and when I was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer. I realized I'd never really told the story. It's always been in bits and pieces, and I talk about myself from the angle that I want to mirror other women's experiences and be the voice for those who've lost their voice to this horrible disease. But I like to focus a lot on what we've done with the charity and the strides we're making. But it occurred to me, I've never really told my story full out. Maybe that was a piece of me I was holding back to be self-protective. I don't know. I've done all kinds of crazy things I thought I would never do. Crashing into researchers' offices, demanding that they give me the time I need, pushing for programs to be open at hospitals that said, oh, inflammatory? Mm. That's a really bad one, sorry, we just no can do. Uh, even posing in a picture topless, literally topless with no breasts with one of my daughters to bring attention to the fact that a mastectomy is not a boob job, it is an amputation. So many things I never thought I would do. So here I am, I'm gonna take some time and tell you my story best I can straight away. Not gonna edit it, I'm sitting in my living room by myself, I've got my tissue ready because I'm probably going to cry at some point and I've got a big glass of iced tea poured because I'm going to try to be here a while because I've never really told it. I hope that you find some value in what I'm sharing. Again, one of the reasons I talk about IBC so much is to bring attention to a disease that has been without a voice for far too long. And I feel that we are making some strides on this disease. So again, um, you and me, I'm going to tell my story. I woke up on, in May of 2007 and my right breast was red hot and swollen. It would literally not fit into the cup of my bra. I was not a particularly busty person and I wasn't overweight before cancer, uh, but it literally was not comfortable to put the bra on. And I had been out in the yard that weekend trimming some roses and I had a lot of antique roses and I thought, well, maybe one of the Thorns got me because a prick from antique rose, it, it, it's a little bit more brutal. And I thought something got me. Um, I couldn't find any point of a, a puncture, but that's the only thing that made sense. So I called up my doctor who I went to go see the very next day. And mind you, I was 49 years old. I hadn't been to an OBGYN in a long time because after my last child at 37, I had to have an emergency hysterectomy because there was some damage done at the birth. Um, but I have been a borderline diabetic my entire life. I failed my first glucose tolerance test in 19. Um, diabetes was always the concern from our family. We didn't typically have any history of cancer to speak of at all. Um, so I wasn't thinking cancer. And also I've been taught all my life that uh, keep your weight down, nurse your babies, which I nursed five, um, to um, check for lumps, things like that, get your mammograms, which I had done all those things. So I wasn't thinking breast cancer. I was thinking an infection. That made sense. So I went to my endocrinologist because he was the only doctor I was seeing on a regular basis. And honestly, um, it was a very maddening experience. I felt like if it had been my nose that was swollen and red and cocked off to the side, he would have taken it more seriously. But he, maybe he was uncomfortable um, because it was my breast. He got silly with me and uh, made jokes about long stem roses. And I didn't understand what he was talking about. I realized later he meant, sometimes when we get a little rose above their breasts, as they get older, it becomes a long stem rose. And it hit me um, how inappropriate and dismissive that was. And I just had to contain my anger to get some answers. Well, he very quickly says, I know what this is. And he ran off into the back. I can hear him flipping through a book. And he told me that um, you have an infection in your pituitary gland and don't freak out. You don't have anything wrong with your brain. Your pituitary glands in your head. It regulates your mammary glands. Obviously something's gone wonky. That's a quote. And uh, it's affecting your breast. And I thought, well, if one breast is wonky, why isn't the other one wonky? And he said, well, breasts are mystery. And the smart alpha side of me when I get stressed is what comes out smart alpha comments. I remember thinking to myself, bite your tongue, bite your tongue. And I thought, well, maybe breasts are a mystery to you, but they're not a mystery, and this is weird. He told me I need to take a low-dose antibiotic for eight weeks 
and uh, come back and it would be better, but it would take a long time because this kind of thing takes a long time. Well, in the meantime, my breast is swelling up. A daily, it, it's starting to itch. It, the nipples turn inward. All kinds of things are happening. I called him. I called other people. He sent me to other people. Long story short, I saw five doctors in four months, and all the only thing they could agree upon was I did not have cancer, that I had some kind of infection. But nobody wanted me to get a mammogram for fear they would rupture my breast. They didn't want me to get a biopsy for fear I would spread the infection deeper. So we were on the stalemate of watching it, which meant doing nothing. Nobody was monitoring me. And people say, be your own best advocate. And I've got a lot of hot buttons, I realize, and that's one of them. You know, you can be your own best advocate if you know what the hell's going on. You can also be your own best advocate if you aren't feeling like poo-poo. As this is progressing, I'm getting in more and more pain, and I can't think straight. And my breast was getting so swollen, I had to pat out my clothes. So I went to work. People couldn't tell. They were different. It was difficult for me to lift my right arm because it hurt so much. So I was not firing all my cylinders, and I am a proactive person. I am a question asker. I am also someone who's done some pretty cool things in my life where I'm used to pushing the envelope into uncomfortable conversations. So it wasn't like I wasn't being proactive, but literally these doctors didn't know. Like I said, the only thing I could agree upon was it wasn't cancer because I asked one at one point, could this be breast cancer? And he goes, oh, don't get silly. Breast cancer doesn't show. And to be told at 49 years old, don't get silly, I was so offended. And, and by the way, I heard some ridiculous things along the way. One doctor told me my breasts were aging differently. Wait for that. Aging differently. I looked at him again. My smile piece, I came out and said, excuse me, but I promise you these are the same age. And he didn't think it was funny. He labeled me as hostile and wouldn't see me anymore. One doctor told me I had what appeared to be a pulled muscle that was making one breast appear larger. And I said, that doesn't make any sense. One doctor told me, could I have maybe menopause if he put it in one boob? I asked him when he repeated himself and he said, why did you not hear me? And I said, no, that is so freaking stupid. I want you to say it again out loud and hear yourself. So I was starting to meet a certain amount of hostility. I was being told I was overly anxious about my breast. I kept, went back to my first doctor and this is where it gets really crazy. Um, I had gone in there and said, look, I don't know what to do. This is really bad. You keep telling me to wait. It's, it's been four months. I think this thing is going to auto amputate. I don't know what to do. Well, he wasn't in that day and I was um, in the lobby um, of his office. I told that story badly, so work with me here. My daughter had a sinus infection and she, her pediatrician's office was next door to my endocrinologist. And I thought, well, I'm there with her. I'm going to pop in. I'm going to ask. He wasn't there that day, but the receptionist told me, Mrs. Arnold, you've called so much. Everything is fine. There's nothing wrong. We told you it's going to take time. I said, look, sweetie, it's been four months. This is really bad. Someone needs to see me. And she said to me, Mrs. Arnold, if you don't leave, we're going to call security. You don't have an appointment. He's not here today. There's nothing we can do for you. When I get mad, I cry. I started to cry. I humiliated myself right there in that lobby, bawling like a baby, didn't know what to do, taking my little girl out with her, you know, prescription for her non-life-threatening sinus infection, thinking, I must have cancer. I don't know what to do. And by the way, I had been Googling like crazy red hot swollen breasts, which by the way, you get a porn virus on your computer. So that didn't help me because in 2006, literally inflammatory breast cancer wasn't listed on the American Cancer website, Susan G. Komen, or any of the places we would think to go about cancer. So uh, when I got to the pharmacy with my daughter's prescription, by then I had composed myself uh, to a certain extent, but I literally scared the poor clerk half to death because I slammed my hands on the counter and said, Is, does anybody know anybody who knows a good doctor because I am in trouble and I need help. Something is wrong with my breast. And this little teenage clerk wrote down a name and slid it across the counter and said, go see her. Everyone loves her. I called her. It was closing time. She said, I need to see you right away. Be here first thing in the morning. We'll do some testing. So I got there the next morning. And that night when I came home, by the way, 
I had done some Googling and I found something that said inflammatory breast cancer. It was on the Mayo Clinic website. It's only three lines. It said inflamed breast, swollen, highly fatal. And I thought that's what I had. That's got to be it. So I go in the next morning to see this uh, doctor who I'd never seen before. And I realize that she's talking to me and she asked me to open my shirt. She puts her hand on my shoulder. And I realized she was praying. And she said, I think I can help you. I think you have inflammatory breast cancer. I told her, thank you. It was the first of a series of thank yous that has colored my life in this journey. I hate that word journey, by the way. It's not a journey, it's an experience, but it's definitely not a journey. Um, I, she, she said, I need to send you for biopsy. I can't do it here. And she sent me to a place and they got me in right away. Ironically, that doctor had a medical emergency um, a few days later and closed her practice and left medicine. So I never got to really fully thank her in person, but I did send her a letter that I heard got to her uh, thanking her for helping me. I felt like it was just a little God moment in my life that that person was just there for me that morning. So I go into this place and it gets a little funny here. Um, again, my smart athlete humor will show in some ways, but remember, I am definitely someone who lives in gratitude. So um, I go into this place and I'm laying on this table and this guy is doing these punch biopsies and I swear he's having trouble puncturing the breast. Um, I never had a biopsy. I didn't know a lot about it. And I didn't know that they could hurt. My breast was so hard. I almost didn't feel it. Um, I remember him muttering about maybe breaking a needle and I thought, oh my gosh, does that really happen? I mean, what have I got myself into here? And um, he did several punch biopsies, a lot of punch biopsies, a lot of punch biopsies. And I'm laying there because as he's taking his time, because he's having some struggle to do it in so many, I'm telling him all that I've been through and he's being very quiet and I know that he knows what I have. I'm sure what I have too. But I hadn't told my husband yet. My husband and my daughter and her husband came with me to wait with me in the lobby. But I didn't tell them that night before what I found because I just didn't know how to say it without information. So I wanted to know what was real before I shared what I, my suspicions were. My husband knew there was definitely something wrong and he was quite worried. But he was hoping that the doctors were right. It was just something it was a slow go to recover. So anyway, he comes back into the room, this young physician, and I think, what a crummy job you've got. You'll never see me again. You have to tell me this bad news. And you'll never know what happens to me because he's, his face is looking very se severe. And he starts to cry. And he sits down on the table next to me and says, Mrs. Arnold, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but you have inflammatory breast cancer. And chances are you're not going to make it. Um, you've been diagnosed for four months. You need to get to someone quickly right away to start chemotherapy. And he just burst into tears and I'm patting him on the back going, oh, sweetie, don't worry. It's going to be okay. And I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing? I mean, I felt so bad for him because he clearly cared, but this is where it gets a little weird to me. And some people don't like this part of the story, but it's my story. So I'm going to tell it what happened. I swear it was like a joke. I go through a series of rooms and the last room was the worst. The next room I got into was sort of a medical office and this nurse is talking to me and she she's very very sweet and I, this did not offend me at all um and she looked at me and she goes well you know you have inflammatory i said yes they've told me that and she said well there's a very good chance you'll die soon i said yes they told me that i get it and um and she looked at me very deadpan and said honey do you know jesus I thought, crap, am I going to make it to the parking lot? I mean, how bad is this? And I told her, yes, ma'am, I do. And uh, why are you asking? And she said, well, I just want to be able to take you to church if you are alone. I care about what's happening to you. And I told her I was good and I appreciated it. Some people don't care for that part of the story, but she was trying to take care of me, body, mind, and soul, I felt like. So I was not at all offended. And she wasn't pushy. And I appreciate her concern. The last room, though, I got mad. I swear, I walked into a room, it was like pink had vomited. It, there was teddy bears and lace and little pink doilies and ribbons. And it was like a nursery on vomit. And as a grown woman who's just told you've got cancer, walk into this pink foo-foo bunny place didn't sit well with me. 
And there was a lady in that room. I swear all I saw was her face because everything in it was pink. It was ridiculous. And she said, well, Mrs. Arnold, they want to start your treatment, but chances are you won't get to have very many. And so we need a deposit. And I told them, okay, well, um, I have a little bit of money and I have good insurance, I think, I hope, I think I do. Uh, so what do you want? And she said, well, we want $20,000. And I just started laughing. I told her, I said, well, you know, they told me I'm not going to make it very long, but I can write that check for you. And she said, oh, good. She got very excited. And I told her, I said, but you know what? It's going to bounce because I don't have $20,000 laying around right now. I've got a bra full of ice that's dripping because it's August. My husband's out in the lobby. I need to go talk to some people. And I left. I'm going to take a sip of tea and keep telling you the story. I told my husband in the car on the way home that I had cancer. And I said, I just can't talk about this. And um, do me a favor. Drop me off at my job. I need to be alone. I was working at a bank. And I can promise you, nobody cares more, cares less about you than people at a bank, I think, sometimes. And so I thought, I will be in silence and I can just finish out the day. I walked into my work and my boss was angry with me for being late. And I said, I'm sorry, uh, sometimes, because they knew I was getting a biopsy. And I said, well, sometimes bad news takes longer than good. And they all got quiet and no one spoke to me for a couple of days. So I went home that night. I told my husband what I'd, been found, what I'd found out and what the plan was. And they'd give me the name of a local oncologist in the Clear Lake area in Houston, Texas to go to. So I went to go see her. And she wanted to start treatment right away. And I didn't know a lot about it. Uh, breast cancer, but it seemed to me that there should be some more tests done to know the extent of the disease, things like that. I'm sort of a science nerd, so it seemed like, although we were kind of behind the curve, that we should do some things. She's like, no, 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 I know all about this, and you should do it. And I said, well, my husband, who is a, 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 a wonderful man, I've married a very long time, he, um, who is someone who's not necessarily a proactive person, he leaves stuff to me. He trusts me. Um, had been up all night Googling and found out there was something at MD Anderson. So I went to see my doctor and told her, well, before we start, can I try to get an appointment at MD Anderson? I didn't know if they let me in. I didn't know how any of that worked. Uh, but living in Houston, Texas, growing up in the shadows of downtown, I knew that was a big place and a big deal. She got mad at me and told me that if I left and not to come back, that she didn't share. And it was the most terrifying moment. That, would, to me, was scarier than my diagnosis because I finally found someone who knew what I had. I finally had someone who was willing to treat me and actually do something about it. But I had this little uh-oh voice of mistrust because of how they were just starting right away. And by the way, she told me, we're only going to give you a couple of chemo that you're not going to make it. We're going to prepare you for hospice. And I'm thinking, she's not even really trying to save me. And maybe that's not appropriate to try to save me. But nonetheless, why would you not send someone with a rare disease to a major center? I thought that MD Anderson back in 2007 had some kind of study about inflammatory. I didn't realize they had a full program. It had opened the year before. Honestly, when I went there, I thought I'd be maybe getting a few chemotherapies and arranging to donate my body to science. I, I didn't know what to expect. Well, this is where it gets strange again. I get there and Dr. Uh, Krista Finelli had started the clinic there with some of the other doctors in MD Anderson the year before, and I was assigned to him. He took all the IBC patients. And he told me it was worse than they told you. And I thought, how could it be worse than what they've told me? Oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into again here? And he goes, well, we're done more examination on you. And they'd run a bunch of tests. He goes, you've got cancer in both your breasts. It's up above your collarbone. Um, you've got cancer free floating around your abdomen. You have a lot of cancer. Technically, I was stage three by the skin of my teeth because it hadn't attacked the organs. They felt like the cancer in my other breast was not a mess, um, stage four spread of IBC, uh, contralateral spread, they said. They felt like it was an older form of cancer. So ironically, IBC saved my life. We wouldn't have known about the other cancer in the other breast. It was heading into my lungs, they said. Uh, it wasn't going nodal. It was going straight in. And that was a triple negative breast cancer. It was older than my IBC, which is also triple negative. So not to confuse you with all that, but it was a very confusing time. I remember um, they answered every question I had, but I didn't ask 
was it going to my brain? And it hadn't gotten to my brain yet, but I remember looking at a PET scan and my whole body was lit up and I remember seeing things lit up here and I'm like, what is that? And they go, oh, they were kind of, oh, shiny. And they, we went another way. I don't remember what happened, but we never finished that part. I realized later that the cancer had been moving up towards my brain, it looks like. Um, maybe that's why in four months it hadn't attacked any of my major organs, although I had cancer free floating in my abdomen. Um, I think uh, that's one of the reasons I was lucky to not be a stage four after four months because I've met women who struggled to get a diagnosis like me who uh, were four months at their diagnosis. So I just kind of wonder about that. Ironically, when I went back to my original doctor and explained to him what had happened so he would know, and I didn't really fault him because he doesn't know what he doesn't know or what his specialty, but I also know he encouraged me to not get um, a biopsy and not get a mammogram. He left medicine for a couple of years. He was worried I'd sue him. I'm, I'm not interested in suing anybody. But I think also one reason he left is I was told that the same week I came in, someone else came in who didn't make it in the same time frame that I was trying to get my diagnosis. So uh, hopefully people won't. Um, when I got to MD Anderson, they started the treatment. And um, at that time, they didn't test me for BRCA. I had no family history and I was 49 years old and the standards were such that they didn't test you. Um, I had FEC and Taxol, and sometimes people, by the way, say, what did you have? I want what you have here well. There's more treatments out now in the last 13 years than there was when I was diagnosed in 2007. So please don't go by my experience. And also, there's so many subsets of cancer that literally when they say customized medicine, they truly mean it. It's like a custom shoe made for you. It fits you exactly in all those little subsets, those little nuances. And so that matters. So I had FEC and Taxol. I had a double mastectomy because both my breasts had cancer. I did not have reconstruction at the time. They felt it was far too dangerous. And also with IBC, now, even though they think you can do it, there's still a significant delay. Then I had six weeks of daily radiation to the IBC side. And the, um, you take a sheet of paper and lay it on your chest and kind of wrap it around. It is a pretty big area. And so I went through that treatment and um, I did well. Oh, I skipped a part. When Krista Finelli told me, we think we can help you. We think we can give you 18 months. That was the goal we were going for. And I remember being so excited, thinking they thought I could live for 18 months. That sounded a lot better than a few, because I still wanted to live and I had young children. And I wanted to also contribute to science in any way that I could with my treatment. Um, I remember when I got into radiation, Wendy Woodward uh, was my radiation oncologist and when she walked in her eyes were red and I could tell that she'd been crying and I said do you need a minute uh, is, did you lose a patient something wrong and she started to tear up again and she said no it's you no one expected you to be here this day we're so excited um, maybe that's one of the reasons why Wendy has been so forefront of my life post to have that personal moment Everyone treated me beautifully well. Everyone was very kind and thoughtful of me, but that little moment meant something to me. That was my first day of radiation um, stimulation, that that conversation happened. So I got the radiation, and then I started meeting women that had IPC. When I was first diagnosed, I was looking for any kind of story about anybody, and all I could find was obituaries. It was really, really discouraging. And um, I was known for something in my community. I had been part of a Laura Recovery Center for Missing Children where I knew a lot of reporters and stuff because I was a spokesperson for that. And so somehow it got decided to do a story about me. And Dave Ward um, announced something about Terry Arnold having inflammatory breast cancer. And once again, I thought, gosh, I'm not going to make it because he went, and God bless Terry Arnold. I thought, well, there it is. That's the nail in that coffin. You know, it was so ominous. And people started finding me. At the time, I lived in Friendswood, Texas, which is a small town on the south side of Houston. And within a very short time, I found 14 women that had this rare disease, they call it. And I started realizing this town is only four miles by four miles wide. How rare could it really be? And I started realizing rare is a label that means something to the medical community, but doesn't mean never. It's just a classification. And so it was interesting. But in this process, I started support groups. I started meeting people. I started doing things to help other women 
not go through what I went through and started also realizing that this orphan form of cancer was so so orphaned, no one was talking about it. And I thought that's not right. When I was diagnosed, a woman showed up at my door one night about nine o'clock and I was just not having it. I uh, was so exhausted because I had people meaning well, trying to make humor. And I have a dark sense of humor, so I get it. Saying things like, oh, look how lucky you are. You're getting a free boob job and a tummy tuck. Well, I didn't need a boob job. I didn't need a tummy tuck. And it was hard to tell people you were going to die. They thought you were being dramatic. But a woman named Cheryl Meslow showed up at my door. And we were friends. Our children played together. We weren't super close friends. But I used to own a bookstore in Houston. And she was a regular customer. And um, Cheryl said, I need to talk to you. And I knew she had breast cancer. But she never said what kind. And we weren't particularly close friends. So... I kind of kept up with her through our common friends. And she said, I have inflammatory. I've been fighting it for 10 years. I've never met anyone else. And it's been such a lonely experience. And I thought, wow, that, that I can't imagine. And she walked me through so much and helped me so much. And Cheryl inspired a lot of what I did afterwards, thinking about not meeting people and not being around people and only finding obituaries, how hard that must be. So I started support groups. I got very active. I tried to volunteer places. I'm an activist at heart. I've done some pretty cool things in my life. Um, I'm very justice oriented. And what happened to me was an injustice. And the feminist side of me could not handle how I was being treated by these doctors. I truly felt that if this had been my nose, they would have ran tests. But there was something about it being your breast that made it funny and silly and a, a joke, a butt of a joke, shall we say, a bad pun. I didn't do well with that either. So um, as time passed, I, I felt incredible pressure. Everyone knew my phone number. Everyone knew who I was. I was everyone's cancer friend. Anybody's best friend's dog in, in you know, far land, nowhere that had cancer, I got a phone call and hear about it. It was really hard. And I would get text messages of, of a bare breast that was swollen and red going, is this inflammatory? I mean, and I didn't mind that. I it was okay with that, but it was just hard to deal with. And um, I was losing it. And I'd gone to about uh, four funerals in six weeks, or maybe six funerals in four weeks. I mean, it's all such a blur. It, in Houston, Texas, a woman that I knew, and not one of them was over 40, and they all died after a very brief battle, and they'd all been misdiagnosed and things like that. It was just hard. Um, I didn't know what to do. I felt like I wasn't doing enough. And I wanted to help, but I didn't know what to do. So I, I crashed into Whitney Woodward's office, literally crashed in without an appointment, caused a bit of a scene. She was very gracious and asked, uh, said she'd be willing to see me. And by the way, I hadn't seen her in a couple of years, so this seemed really weird. And I realized what I'd done as I'm sitting in her office that I kind of caused a scene and crashed into an office of this incredibly important well-respected researcher at MD Anderson. I'm like, oh, you know, but here I am. Uh, she was very kind and she was typing and she had her back to me. And she said, give me a minute, let me finish the thought and I'll talk to you. And I just blurted out, I want to fund research. And her chair slowly turned around and she said, you know, I've been waiting for you to get mad. She said, you've never been mad. I said, no, I haven't been mad, but the injustice of this is getting to me. And she said, well, I have a project and it's only $30,000 and it might not work, but I need to know and I can't get that money and I need to know. So I'll tell you what happened next. I left this woman's office, a woman who I absolutely adore and admire so much, promising that I would give her $30,000. And I thought, what have I done? I don't have $30,000. Here I am living with cancer bills like crazy, even though I have good insurance. There's definitely some hidden expense to all this. Um, and I promised her I'd give her $30,000. And I thought, you know what? I have five kids. I probably spent $30,000 at Sonic. I will figure this out. Well, about that time, there was a little backstory brewing of a young doctor out of Ohio named Lori Gilgrenham. And if you know anything about the IDC network, you've heard her name before. Lori had come to Houston to get her care because she didn't feel she could get what she needed at the time in Ohio. She wanted to be a specialty clinic. She was a physician and she wanted to help research and then also hopefully bring more education to her home state on this rare disease. Lori and I were talking 
about what was happening. And she said, you know, you're doing some good things with support group. She was part of all that. She was acting all that. She said, but we need to get research funded. And she said, I'm going to try my best to make it. And if I do, I'm going to be changing my life. I want to focus harder on my family and my children. I will still be a doctor, but I don't want to run a charity. I want you to start a charity and I will help you. And I told her about what I wanted to do. And we agreed to start the IBC Network Foundation. And she and I together with her family and friends raised $35,000 in six weeks and gave it to Dr. Wendy Woodward for that. And that was in um, 2007 when we filed for our 501c3. So then we have now got close to two million in research, funded two clinical trials, we funded a CME, we funded um, a lot of things. Uh, we have a booth in San Antonio, Texas every year to help bring education to doctors because this isn't presented at medical conferences. Um, doctors say, well, we all go to the same conferences. We all, well, guess what? IBC is not presented. So maybe your small town doctor has taken the time to read the papers, or maybe your big city doctor hasn't taken the time to read the papers. It's really kind of a crapshoot on what they choose to educate themselves on. IBC is coming more into the forefront in education and medical school, which makes me very happy. But think about it. If you're a young mom and your breast swells up and the baby's not nursing right, are you going to go to an OBGYN or breast surgeon? Chances are you're going to go to OBGYN. Well, I hate to say it, those guys are more about downstairs than up, okay? Or maybe you're going to go to your pediatrician. Or if you've got a rash, you're going to go to your dermatologist. All of those specialties that make sense about these signs and symptoms of inflammatory are probably who we're going to go to. And also, we've been very trained, and for the good of it, to look for lumps, early detection, self-exam, mammogram. Unfortunately, IBC shows up very, very quickly. It confuses people because it appears like an injury or an infection. Mammograms don't pick it up. Ultrasounds don't pick it up. And biopsies have a false negative rate of 25% because it's webbing diffused like cotton candy, which means it's hard to get a good read, which is one of the reasons that doctor with me was doing so many biopsies. He wanted to make sure he got a good read because he knew by looking at me I had inflammatory. There is a clinical diagnosis criteria out there. There's a look to it. There's a look. So anyway, Lori unfortunately didn't make it. Her legacy is quite strong and some wonderful things are happening in Ohio. There's actually going to be a program at the Stephanie Spillman Center under the James. It's going to start in January of um, 2022. Um, they've been treating IBC now for many years. Um, but they want to make a dedicated program to uh, further enhance what we've been doing there. So that's quite exciting. Um, so I guess what I want to say, this is my story of my diagnosis. This is some of what led me into advocacy. The IBC network is now 10 years old um, and we have a sister charity in the UK. We have a sister charity now in Australia who are following our all volunteer model, uh, uh, all volunteer ran model to uh, fund research and educate. Uh, hopefully we'll get something going in Canada. We've been working on that for a few years. Unfortunately, the pandemic has slowed everything down and that's going to be a hard go. That's such a massive country. Um, that's going to be a hard go. And IBC funding was easier to do in the U.S. because MD Anderson had an infrastructure. Um, in time, we were able to do things at Duke, at Vanderbilt, and also at Dana-Farber. Uh, but those are newer programs. So there is more research happening and more interest coming. But studying IBC is a career risk. It's hard to get funds for a rare disease. Um, so in the job you have as a researcher, if you don't get grants, you don't have a job anymore. That's how it works. I didn't know that. That's how I got interested. In wanting to fund. I saw people who wanted to study IBC that said, you know what, if I can't get a grant approved, I'm not going to have a job. And also there's other infrastructure things they need. They need a dedicated space. They need a cell line. They, they need all these things that there's not that much of. So we have been part of helping create a lot of that. And that's something I'm very proud of. And it's something that I feel is a strong legacy to the future. I feel like I'm standing on the 
shoulders of giants in other ways. And hopefully someone can stand on us a little bit as we carry this further, just like we're seeing happen right now in the UK and we're seeing what happening in Australia and hopefully what will happen in Canada and, and on because I get inquiries from all over the world about what can we do for inflammatory. I am convinced this disease is not rare. I am convinced that it's just under tracked. We don't have a medical encoding number. We don't have any freaking idea how many of us there really are. Because when you get diagnosed, it's just labeled as breast cancer, not inflammatory breast cancer. I would love to know how many of us they are. I know that research that we do have shows that IBC is only 6% of all known breast cancers. There's like 16 different kinds of breast cancer. But it makes up the highest majority of deaths of breast cancer. So that disconnect to me warrants serious conversation. And I'm convinced if we can figure out how to stop a fast cancer like inflammatory that presents at a late stage, it's very aggressive, that doesn't behave this normal way to um, treatment as other breast cancers, we can maybe stop a slower growing cancer. I don't want to have a cancer off. All cancers are awful. But I think if we can put some money and some serious attention to late stage, stopping late stage, we can do something. And inflammatory breast cancer is viewed as late stage. And that's what we find with the IVC Network Foundation. So back to my story. I'm a very grateful woman. Um, I've been married a long time. And I started hearing women say their husbands left them. They couldn't handle it. Um, I don't want to give them a get out of jail card for free because I think to leave someone with an illness is awful. But I think cancer doesn't um, define you. I think it reveals you. I think it sometimes reveals weak areas that just get weaker. Um, sometimes I think it can be a cleansing fire and it can bring some, some, there can be some good in it. Not that God gave you cancer to make there be good. I, I hate that kind of thought. Um, it's just sometimes it can make you pony up about what's important in your life. And my husband really ponied up and I'm very grateful. My family was very good to me and I'm very grateful for them. I have never been really comfortable with the mentality of get your tribe together and do all that. I don't have a tribe. My mom died when I was a kid. My parents weren't married. My husband's from a very small family. And I don't know what would have done without uh, my immediate family and also my friends from church and friends from the homeschooling community who just rallied around me and helped me through everything. Um, so I guess I have a tribe. I just didn't know. Uh, but sometimes this is a very lonely journey. And at the end of the day, it's just you by yourself thinking about what you have to do. And I say that's when the monsters come late at night when it gets scary and your brain can't turn off. That's why the support groups are so important to me and having education out there to help them and be empowered and make it better for the next person down the line and hopefully yourself as well. I know women who have donated to things we have uh, funded that later actually benefited from that research, which is really mind blowing when you think about it because research is slow. Um, Sometimes people ask me about long-term side effects. Chemo brain is real, and I swear I sat in a corner and practically drooled for the first year. It kicked my butt. I see other people blow through, but I found it hard. I, I didn't find the treatment hard. I found the fatigue after the treatment hard. That's what got to me. And I also had lymphedema. Uh, my arm swelled up a few days before the breast swelled up. I didn't know anything about lymphedema. But in the time of being misdiagnosed, lymphedema got a really big head start on me. So if you follow anything about what I do, I mean, you can even see my clothes are always a little crooked because my arm's crooked, my body's crooked. Um, and my face is a little crooked from it. It actually pushes up into my cheek. Um, I talk about lymphedema a lot. It's something I want to talk more about because uh, women with inflammatory have a much higher risk of lymphedema because of the way the disease impacts the nodal area, but also the treatment too. So those are things. But for the win of it all, I, I, I wouldn't trade anything I've been through because I've had a really good life. I've had a, a happy life. I was not thinking I would live to see my first grandchild be born who was due at the time I was meant to finish treatment if I got that far. And I did get to see her be born. And um, she's my little co-survivor, I call her. And um, we now have 14 grandchildren and the 15s ones in the oven, shall we say. And which is pretty remarkable considering there's the oldest one's only 13. There's a lot of babies in my family and I love it. I'm, very grateful for the things that I've lived to see, the gifts that people have given me, hopefully the gifts that I can give other people by fighting for this. 
I literally work the IBC network like a full-time job. I put in 40 hours plus a week, and then in, in, uh, especially in se August and September, which is September right now, and I'm recording this, I uh, am busy doing something almost every waking moment because um, the demands are so great. I'm not complaining. I love it. I feel like, though, I've only scratched the surface of what needs to be done now that the IBC network is 10 years old. It took a long time to get people to even want to talk to me. I remember I didn't have a smartphone, but I had a laptop, and I would literally drive from McDonald's to McDonald's because I'd be placing phone calls and sending emails and trying to get doctors to talk to me or trying to get speaking engagements to talk to someone or anything to bring this word inflammatory out and the, the difference is out. And I would literally drive from McDonald's to McDonald's and use their Wi-Fi on my laptop to not miss a message because I realized if I missed a message, I often didn't get a second chance. And uh, I got so good at it, I learned you could pull up to them and connect their Wi-Fi and not have to get out and go inside because I literally would stop it six times on the way to some places, six times on the way home, and uh, to try to just get someone to listen to me. Um, but it worked, and people have listened. But like I said, we've just scratched the surface. Researchers need millions of dollars, and I want to give them that. I want to see that happen, whether it's through the IBC network or through you supporting something that a program is directly doing. We compete with ourselves all the time by fundraising for them and for us and with them and for us. All we care about is at the end of the day, it gets the right place. But I wanted this to be a little bit about my story, but it's hard to not have my story morph into the foundation and all the things that have happened in all the plans we have for the future. But I realized today, I've never really told the whole thing. And I still haven't told the whole thing. I don't know if I ever really can, because there's just so much to tell. But I wanted to talk about my diagnosis part, about the treatment, about my family, and what I've done with it. And if you don't want to be an advocate, that's fine. That's not everybody's thing. There's so many ways people can be involved and we need it all. So no pressure and no pressure just because you had this really sucky form of cancer to do anything else about it for anybody else. No pressure. I want you to live your life. But this is where I was put. And I think that a lot of my life experience for things I've done in the past has given me a skill set to be here today. And I'm also very grateful that my husband's so supportive that when I told him I wanted to do more, he said, well, I have only one uh, concession and it's non-negotiable. And I said, what is that? He said, you can never draw a salary. And I said, I'm good with that. Thank you. And um, so that helps us run very lean. I know one day we're going to grow so much that we're going to need someone to replace me and I'm going to age out. And that person's going to want to get paid and that's okay. But for right now, this is where we are. And I'm really grateful for him for that sacrifice because we're not rich people so I'm grateful that he is willing to keep sticking with me on this it means a lot to him um, I guess that's about all but I saw a little video today from Matthew McConaughey and he said what story have you not told what story do you need to tell and I thought you know what I've been holding back on telling this fully because I didn't know if it would interest you but also maybe I didn't want to think about it so much because it is still a little scary for me. I'm very grateful, though, and I can't imagine what it's like for somebody who's in the thick of it in a way that I never was, although believe me, it was definitely no walk in the park, but I am what they call NED. I'm grateful for that. I don't take it for granted. I do what I do not because I had this disease. I do what I do because I meet a lot of other women who do, and I hear from family members of people who have lost people. And that is why I'm here. But again, thank you, Matthew, for the little poke this morning that said, hey, what story have you not told that you need to tell? So I'll sign off with my usual hope always. Thank you for listening. God bless.